Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. John Duyard, and welcome to the Life Spa Podcast. And today, we're going to take a deep dive into breathing. We're going to dive into all the ancient wisdom of breathing practices and the modern science. It should be a really exciting discussion. You know, breathing is probably one of the most important things that we do every single day. Every time you feel a little bit of stress, you change how you breathe. You don't really realize it, but slowly but surely we start to become more and more of a shallow breather. And the way that the rib cage is set up is that the upper part of the chest, which is the kind of fight or flight receptors, when you breathe into those upper lobes of your lungs, you trigger a, <gasps> a bear in the woods emergency response, which gets you up a tree, saves your life, everything's good. When you breathe deep and long and slow into the lower lobes of your lungs, which are gravity fed, and most of the blood for exchange is going to be down there, but also the parasympathetic rest and digest and rebuild nervous system receptors predominate in the lower lobes of your lungs. So when you breathe long, slow, and deep, like a baby nursing, in Germany, it's called stillen to still the baby's nervous system. It calms the whole nervous system down. <gasps> you see a bear in the woods, you take an upper chest, gasping breath, trigger an emergency response, get up a tree, save your life. So when you are under even the littlest bit of stress, we change how we breathe. And that's done by your diaphragm. Your diaphragm will either contract fully or it'll contract sort of partially. Studies show that the diaphragm is directly linked neurologically to the emotional cortex of your brain, the limbic system, the amygdala, and it's bi-directional. So if you see something that scares you, that breath change, that diaphragmatic change, impacts the limbic system, tells you, yes, this is an emergency, get out of the way. But also if you have old emotional trauma that are stored in our limbic system, that can also keep you breathing in a shallow way. So over time, what happens is we slowly start to shallow breathe. Just because we live on the planet and we live not in sync with nature, think of our ancestors. I mean, yeah, they got chased by bears and mountain and lions and, uh, you know, once in a while. But for the most part, if you think of the birds, the deer in the woods and the wilderness, it's pretty still, quiet, peaceful, calm existence. That's the general theme when you're living in nature living in our modern culture is not that theme. We are constantly worried about this, constantly going here. Our cortisol levels are off the charts. We're out of sync with our biological clocks and our circadian rhythms. We have to bring those back into balance. And one of the best ways to do that is to learn how to breathe. And many of us don't breathe very well. I mean, one study about a year ago showed that 91% of athletes that were tested did not have a diaphragm relaxing, contracting fully. So most of us don't. So we all need to relearn how to breathe, particularly strengthen the diaphragm, because the diaphragm is the number one breathing muscle. And if that's not working properly, and 91% of athletes, they don't have one working properly, most of us don't. And the reality is that most of us sit, I'm sitting as I'm speaking to you today. You're probably sitting as you're listening to this. Maybe you're in a gym working out, that would be better. But the point is that most of us sit on the way to the gym, on the way home from the gym, in the car, uh, and in front of our computer, while we're eating, watching TV, we sit in an inordinate amount. Chairs, the first chairs, which were just for royalties, were like 5,000 years. We've been on this planet as Homo sapiens for almost 300,000 years. A lot of that time, no chairs. Squatting, lying down, and it's a completely different postural effect on how you breathe when you squat versus sit or when you lie down. So we have to retrain ourselves to do that. When we sit, as I sit and slouch a little bit, my rib cage gets jammed into my abdomen and it pushes my diaphragm down into a pre-contracted position. Remember, your diaphragm is trying to contract and suck air into the rib cage and open the whole thing up. But if your rib cage has what's called elastic recoil, which means it always wants to squeeze the air out, it's always trying to exhale, just like a balloon. The balloon is always ready to let the air out. You open up the balloon, it opens, you pop the balloon, all the air comes rushing out. 
So as soon as the diaphragm contracts and it opens up this very rigid rib cage, as soon as the diaphragm relaxes, all the air comes out. So what happens over time is that we slowly, we have science to show that 90% of athletes don't have a diaphragm contracting and relaxing fully, which means they're starting to breathe more shallow, by definition, into the upper respiratory receptors, which are fight or flight nature, telling your body that yes, life is in fact becoming more and more an emergency as we become more and more shallow breathers, right? So, so the rib cage tendency over time is to become extremely rigid. And when we learn how to get that rib cage moving and give you full respiratory capacity again, that rib cage, instead of becoming a cage squeezing your heart and your lungs 26,000 breaths per day, it becomes like levers massaging your heart and your lungs 26,000 times per day. And most importantly, that rib cage is a pump for your lymphatic system, which is majorly pumped by your diaphragm and the rib cage movement. They both work together. The brain lymphatic system, which dumps three pounds of trash and plaque out of your head every year while you sleep, called the glymphatic system, is pumped by the diaphragm. If that diaphragm is weak, you don't get that brain lymphatic pump. Studies show when the brain lymphatic system is compromised because of poor diaphragmatic function, that's linked to anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, inflammation, infection, and even autoimmune concerns and many other things as well. So the diaphragm is really important for getting the trash out of the head, for cognitive function, for mental clarity or your focus, your mood, all of those kind of things. But if a diaphragm is weak, the brain lymphatic system will build up. If the diaphragm is weak, the, di the whole lymphatic system becomes compromised. The lymph trying to take the trash out of your heart and your lungs. The lymph is trying to take the trash out of your abdomen. In particular, the diaphragm is linked to pumping the lymph up out of your abdomen, up into the heart to be processed to the liver and excreted, right? So if that diaphragm is weak, you're gonna get poor lymphatic function where? Around your belly and your hips, and that's the number one pump for those areas. So most of the studies show, I wrote an article about how the lymphatic system, the, top, the undigested food that we don't digest very well, will actually get pushed into the lymph around the belly and stay there as reserve fuel for a rainy day, right? So all these things happen because of poor digestion, stress things, but also part and parcel, poor diaphragmatic function, how important that is, right? To be able to breathe in a complete and an efficient manner, the way we're designed. But because we sit and we're sedentary and we're stressed more than our traditional ancestors may have been, we have to do breathing exercises on a regular basis, which we're gonna dive into here in just a little bit, okay? Um, so, what does that mean? Well. First and foremost, we have to learn how to understand the dynamics of shallow breathing. There's something in Western medicine called over-breathing, which is very much like shallow breathing. And when you shallow breathe, one study showed that the people who shallow breathe, 75% of the oxygen they were breathing in, right, they were breathing it right back out unused which means that we're trying to jam in all this oxygen, but um, the blood is already 98% saturated with oxygen. It can't take anymore, so you breathe it right back out. 75% of what you're breathing in, you breathe right back out. It's a pretty inefficient way of breathing when you shallow breathe, right? Well, studies also show that when you blow off all that oxygen that you can't use, that you also blow off carbon dioxide which is blown off in excess. And there's a balance between carbon dioxide and oxygen in your blood that has to be maintained. So what happens when people shallow breathe over time because of stress, aging, becoming more rigid, sedentary, becoming more stiff, you start shallow breathing and you have high oxygen levels and because you blow off excess CO2 while you're trying to blow off 75% of the oxygen that you can't use because you're already 98% saturated in your blood with oxygen, your CO2 levels become low, oxygen becomes high, and that is the perfect storm for anxiety. 
That's why when people have an anxiety attack, they put a paper bag over their mouth and they rebreathe their carbon dioxide. And that brings their carbon dioxide levels up and it makes them calm again, right? So that ratio between carbon dioxide and oxygen is very, very important, which is why pranayam techniques teach long, slow breathing techniques, because the longer and slower it is, the more time the body has to bring in the oxygen and use it efficiently, and also more time to build carbon dioxide levels, which is a really important piece of the puzzle, right? Because something called the Bohr effect shows that when the oxygen levels are high and CO2 levels are low, not only do you have anxiety or stress provoked, but you also have the bond between the oxygen and the hemoglobin in your blood super duper tight, which means that the oxygen is staying lingering in your blood longer than it should, as opposed to getting into your tissues. And when you do long, slow breathing or breath holding or pranayam techniques, pranayam techniques means prana, means breath, ayam means to pause, hold, or extend the breath. So it was all about lengthening that breath and allowing natural carbon dioxide levels to rise. And when it rises, that's the trigger to release the oxygen from the hemoglobin in your blood and drive it into your brain, into your muscles, into your whole body for tissue repair and prevent you from opportunistic um, uh, hypoxic stem cells that can actually cause real damage to your body. You do not want to have a body that's hypoxic. You want to have oxygenated body and you don't want all the blood holding on into the, all the oxygen staying and lingering in your blood because your CO2 levels are low and your oxygen levels are high. Why? Because you become a shallow breather and you're blowing off all the CO2 while you are trying to drive in more oxygen, but 75% of the oxygen is, is actually being blown out unused because we are breathing in such an inefficient way. I hope all that makes sense. So basically, shallow breathing makes you have a fight or flight emergency reaction, but it also keeps the oxygen lingering in your blood so the body becomes hypoxic and then you start wanting, running the risk of mutagenic stem cells to activate and create problems in your body, not to mention just not having the mitochondrial energy that you need to drive the energy and vitality that we know is a, a, a risk factor for aging. We produce less, we deliver less oxygen, we produce less mitochondrial energy because we don't breathe properly. And that's something that we can change because we have the ability to change how we breathe and retrain these muscles. The diaphragm is just like a muscle. If you wanna pump your iron and make your biceps big, you can do that. You can do the same thing with your diaphragm. You can't put a, you can't put a barbell on it because it's inside, but we can train it. And we're gonna talk more about how to do that as we kind of dive into this a little bit further, right? So that's one of the most important things is understanding that as we shallow breathe, we become over breathers. And that is the, the, big, the big problem is that as shallow breathers, we become hypoxic. Now, when you look at free divers who dive down into the ocean, 300 feet, stay there for the record right now for holding the breath without any oxygen supplementation before they went down was 11 minutes. Um, well, that's, that's just 11 minutes is the record of holding the breath. With a little oxygen before they held their breath, the record is 25 minutes. So imagine holding your breath for 25 minutes, even if you had a little oxygen before. That's a crazy amount of time. See, you and I have a gene in our brainstem, um, a receptor on our brainstem that activates a gene that actually tells us to um, regulate when we breathe based on how much carbon dioxide levels we have. That receptor in the brain, if for most us Westerners, has become super incredibly hypersensitive to even the littlest bit of carbon dioxide that builds up, the body goes, oh, you better breathe. And we keep breathing more shallow and more shallow. And CO2 levels keep getting lower. Oxygen keeps staying at a very, very high level. Like the body gets bent out of shape thinking, I got to keep my oxygen saturation at 98% saturation. And by doing that in an over-breathing fashion, we're blowing off all the carbon dioxide, which is dangerous because not only does it produce anxiety, but also keeps the body in a hypoxic state. But studies also show 
that with these free divers that they had an enormous amount of health benefits when they were free diving. If they didn't die down there by pushing it too hard, which is a very risky thing to do, they had a lot of amazing health benefits and they weren't sure what those health benefits were coming from. So they studied these free divers and they found that when they were diving down in the ocean, now just think about this, and I've tried this, and if you've ever done this, it's a pretty freaky place, diving down into the dark, um, and it's freezing cold, and there may be sharks, and it's scary. I mean, right, we're all afraid of the dark a little, right? And you're breathing, and now you're supposed to be calm enough to just go all the way down 300 feet and hold your breath for this enormous amount of time. Well, the neat thing is that when you're diving down and you're doing that, your CO2 levels are rising, which is telling you to relax and calm down. So you're getting the benefit of high CO2, which has a calming effect. I mean, years ago, in the 40s and 50s, there were clinics for anxiety where people would go and they would, the doctors would mix a little oxygen with carbon dioxide and people would breathe in more carbon dioxide than they normally would and it would have a calming effect on their nervous system. That study was hard science, it's still very valid, but when the pills came into play and the pharmaceuticals came into play for anxiety, they were just pushed away because you could just pop a pill, right? A lot easier than going to a clinic and breathing carbon dioxide. So they had that benefit, but at the same time, as CO2 levels were rising, they were driving all this oxygen into their body, so they're swimming, going down, going down, going down, and their muscles were extremely functional. And they learned how to create resiliency in this receptor in the brainstem for carbon dioxide. So they became more tolerant to higher levels of carbon dioxide, and that's exactly why they were able to stay so calm and stay super oxygenated and do this for such a long period of time. I mean, there's divers um, off the coast of South Africa. The Native Americans used to dive down for extraordinary long periods of time. There's still women off the coast of Japan, women divers who dive and stay down for extraordinary long times to, to do their fishing and at very deep depths um, for five, 10, 15, 10 minutes or so or longer. Um, it's quite an amazing feat. We're all human, we all have the ability to do that. I'm not asking for you to have that ability, but I do think that we have to change the, the over-breathing and the shallow breathing to nice, long, slow, deep breathing. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about um, what's in Ayurveda, pranayam, prana means breath, yam means to hold, pause, or extend the breath. There's techniques called kumbhak in Ayurveda, which means to actually hold the breath. And these techniques are quite amazing because that is what, you know, one of the goals of yoga was to become able to really slow the breath way, way down and even extend the breath for longer periods of time. That has been studied based on these free divers to have something called intermittent hypoxia. So this is an interesting chemistry, which is another piece of the puzzle as to why you want to learn how to slow your breath down, if not eventually, you know, be able to hold your breath for a little longer than you are now, not 11 minutes or longer or whatever, two or three minutes maybe would be long enough to get all the benefits that we're talking about. So when you have, when you hold your breath and you go into something called intermittent hypoxia, your oxygen saturation is usually 98% saturation when you start. But if you hold your breath, obviously the oxygen saturation is gonna go down. Carbon dioxide levels are gonna be going up telling your body you're getting all this oxygen, the body's really happy, the brain's really happy, the muscles are really happy, except for the oxygen, the blood starts to go down. And when it goes down into the low 90s and into the 80s, you're in something called intermittent hypoxia. It means a short period of time, the blood is saying, hey, this is a problem, we better breathe soon because we don't have, we're, we're running low here, we gotta take a breath. Now, when that happens, the body senses an emergency and brings in all the emergency repair vehicles to kick in. It's very much like autophagy through calorie restriction. You don't eat a lot or fast. You get this autophagy chemistry, which is cellular recycling and cellular repair. The body goes, whoa, we better go into the cupboard and make a soup out of something, and we're gonna give that and deliver it as energy. Same thing happens when you hold your breath for a short period of time and your oxygen saturation goes below 90 into the 80s, you're in something called intermittent hypoxia. And that means that these emergency vehicles come in. And the studies show it actually increases stem cells, which was a Nobel Prize winning molecule 
that was the panacea that won the Nobel Prize in 1998 in chemistry for curing everything. Nitric oxide is amazing. Um, it also has been shown to increase what's called EPO, erythropoietin, a hormone that Lance Armstrong got busted for injecting in his blood to dope him to give him more energy during the Tour de France. Little did he know that all he had to do was learn how to breathe and hold his breath and he could make his own. There's also what are called endothelial growth factors. Endothelial growth factors are things that protect the arterial lining from damage, number one cause of heart disease, right? Uh, there are transcription factors called the guardian of your genome that protects your genetic code from expressing negative traits. We all know that aging is accelerated by DNA damage and you can protect your DNA damage by actually doing pranayam, prana being breath, yam mean hold, pause, or extend your breath, allowing CO2 levels to rise. That's the chemistry. Even though your oxygen saturation may be going down a little bit in a, in a breath hold period, your, your body's creating that intermittent hypoxia benefit, which is giving you all these benefits. Other things show that it lowers blood pressure, lowers blood sugar. It also, and my favorite one of all, is it actually changes what's called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability for you to change your brain, your old patterns of behavior. You know, we're locked into doing the same dumb stuff again and again and again. We react to that same person the same way over and over. We have the same relationships in our life over and over and over again, right? Inter uh, neuroplasticity means you actually change those patterns, right? You go home for the holidays, you start acting like a four-year-old again around your family members because they trigger you. Neuroplasticity gives you the ability to change those patterns and look at it from a much deeper, more um, cognizant place. So you're not actually just reactively doing the same dumb thing again and again and again. I've done podcasts and many articles on Ayurvedic psychology where we dive into that a little bit more. Maybe the most important part though, because Ayurveda, Ayur means life, Veda means truth, it really means about getting the truth of your life out. And that's the problem is as we become shallow breathers, we are fight or flight all the time, always thinking I have to save myself, get reward chemistry to feel safe and secure. I'm only satisfied when good things happen. My whole life depends on what's happening. Where in Ayurveda, letting the truth of you out is realizing that I'm happy for no reason. I love you for no reason. And this is the ultimate goal and breathing is a critical piece of that puzzle. You can't ignore that. Ayurvedic psychology piece, right? So that's what breathing does. Every one of the breathing techniques that I've written about, and by the way, at lifespa.com, you get all these breathing techniques and videos of how to do them for free on my website. I've written articles on the science of almost all of the breathing techniques that I could find research on, and those are all for free. Uh, and you get them in our newsletter um, every week at lifespy.com and that newsletter is for free and the information on my website at lifespy.com. We have a thousand articles and videos there, all science-based, ancient wisdom, modern science there for you to go to, to dive deep. And you can type in breathing, you can type in breath retention, you can type in pranayama, and a whole slew of articles and videos, training videos will come up for free. Just so you know, that's all. If you want to take a deeper dive, uh, look into the science. Um, on this podcast, there's no science links, but in the articles, there's links to all the uh, claims that I make for some of these breathing techniques, right? So you know about that. So that's what intermittent hypoxia is all about. So this whole thing becomes really quite fascinating, right? Um, so I think that's enough of an intro. Now let's talk about how do we fix some of these things, right? What do we do? Well, I think the first thing is to um, learn how to strengthen your diaphragm. We know that 91% of athletes don't have one work and probably none of us do, so we have to strengthen your diaphragm. And I want to point you to an article called The Best Diaphragmatic Breathing Exercises. Really important article. There's three videos there. I invite you to watch all three videos. There, It's on lifespy.com. The first video is really simple. It's just learning how to breathe with your belly. So if you put your hand on your belly and your chest, and then just breathe in through your nose. By the way, it's all going to be through your nose. In through the nose and out through the nose. So if you breathe in through your belly, you're going to feel your belly move, and only your belly move. You can just practice that for a while. Then you can actually breathe belly and then chest. And then after a while, you just see belly, chest, then you can do upper chest. So there's three parts to the breathing process. Belly, chest, upper chest. 
That's it. That's the first video. Get good at that so you can actually isolate those three phases of breathing. The second video is something I call flossing your diaphragm, where you actually want to break up the adhesions between your diaphragm and your rib cage. Rib cage wants to do this, diaphragm becomes weaker, and the diaphragm becomes tighter, and it clamps down on the, on the rib cage so the whole thing becomes cage-like, right? So one of my favorite ways to do that is to take your arms up, breathe in as deeply as possibly as you possibly can through your nose, and arms go up as high as you possibly can. It looks like this. Breathe in, and then out. Arms come back down. And again, arms up, and then arms come back down. When you do that, you should feel that underneath your rib cage, your diaphragm is contracting. You'll feel it. Maybe for the first time ever, you're feeling your diaphragm. So you do 10 arms up and then come back down. Then you do 10 to the side and you'll feel a pull right in through here and exhale out, arms come down each time. And then 10 to the other side and arms come back down. I love this one so much because I've been teaching breathing techniques since I came back from India in 1986-1987. And I would always tell folks that this is like the most amazing thing that I teach, but nobody does it. Nobody follows through with these breathing techniques. Why? Because the rib cage is tight. And to just breathe requires you to breathe through this rigidity. And it seems to take an enormous amount of effort that a lot of us just don't feel like we have, so we just give up and don't do it. And the diaphragm is contracted and not functioning as well as it could, so you're asking the diaphragm to fully contract now, hasn't done that in a while, so this is all about retraining. So using your arms is sort of a way to sort of, um, to kind of engage your physical body, and it just makes it a lot easier. I'm bringing my arms up, it's like stretching. You feel good when you stretch. That's that kind of a feeling. No one says, I don't want to stretch. It just feels good to stretch, right? And do that kind of a thing. Um, and that's a beautiful way to get started. Um, the third video is actually doing the belly chest, upper chest breathing, which is called Durga Pranayama officially, um, while you're doing some very simple yoga postures. And I give you a very simple like cobra or sphinx posture where you go into an extension and breathe into that posture, belly, chest, upper chest. It's such a cool, I love doing this whenever I, I'm doing any type of exercise. I will do a series of, of, a, of a child's pose, a bridge, an extension pose like cobra or sphinx, or I'll put myself into a gentle twist and then breathe into that and force that resiliency and elasticity of my rib cage again. None of us have it, all of us need it. And it's so simple. The, the, the yoga postures that I give you are super gentle. Anybody can do it, but you can take it to another level. I'm sure many of you are great yogis and can do much more. But doing the maximal inspiratory breathing during these techniques is critically important. And in Western medicine, these maximal inspiratory breathing techniques have been well studied. So what's different about doing pranayama, lots of you I know are breathers and you do yoga pranayama, is very few of us during yoga practice actually do maximum inspiratory breathing. Well, if you go to the medical journals, maximum inspiratory breathing is what they studied. And they found that it would lower pressure, blood pressure in just three minutes as good as a medication. It was shown to reverse heartburn, GERD, reflex, and indigestion in about 10 or 15 different studies because what happens in heartburn and GERD and reflux and indigestion is the stomach gets pushed up against the diaphragm. And now the diaphragm is trying to contract and there's a big stomach in the way and it simply can't. So by actually getting that diaphragm to contract will actually free up the relationship between the stomach and the diaphragm. In fact, the stomach can get so out of balance that normally the stomach will hang off the diaphragm. The esophagus goes through the diaphragm. Stomach is below the diaphragm. But sometimes the digestive problems can become so extreme that the stomach can get pushed up against the diaphragm and literally herniate through the lower esophageal sphincter causing a hiatal hernia. And that's just so ex extreme because you know, the stomach normally hangs and now the stomach is pushing up with such pressure it's breaking through one of the most powerful muscles 
in your body, right? So that's just a crazy thing that happens, but about 15 studies show in the medical journals that you can reverse all those indigestive issues by breathing, right? Nobody tells you that when you go to the doctor, they just give you meprazole, but if they would just give you the breathing technique, it might actually avoid a lot of the unnecessary medication. So critically important. I've written articles about something called stomach pulling that I want to invite you to if you have any heartburn or indigestion. There's visceral massage techniques that are also really important and these breathing techniques that are really critically important as well. So these maximal inspiratory breathing techniques in Western medicine um, uh, have been shown to be approved for COVID before, during, and after. They activate a powerful pump for your whole lymphatic system, particularly lymph around your belly and hips, like we mentioned. They also, women with breast cancer, have been shown to have more congestion of the anterior diaphragmatic lymph nodes. So again, getting that diaphragm working. Remember, the diaphragm is a lymphatic pump. The lymphatic system has three basic functions. One, carry your immune system. Your lymph system gets compromised because of poor diaphragmatic function. You're going to have compromised lymph uh, immunity or compromised immune function. And the gut immunity is linked to the drainage of the toxins from the intestinal tract, which, which builds up around the intestinal tract. And that's all the extra weight around your belly and your hips. That's poor lymphatic flow due to some type of underlying digestive issue, which is directly linked to gut immunity. Gut immunity has now been directly linked to respiratory immunity. Those are bidirectional. So when your lymph system, because of poor breathing, diaphragmatic function becomes compromised, so does your immune system. Your lymph is also trying to take the trash out and detoxify you, and it's also trying to carry fat, properly broken down fat, as nutrients into every cell of your body for baseline energy. So if you're tired and lethargic, not only do you get oxygenation from breathing properly to oxygenate the mitochondria to make energy, but you also get delivery of better fats for baseline energy as well. I always think of that fat delivery of energy as like that, that little silver battery that's in your radio that's like the backup battery. You have to put the regular batteries in, but you have that other backup battery. That's sort of the lymphatic delivery, that baseline energy you need as well. So the, the breathing techniques in Western medicine are, they use a little device and you suck in the air and you try to get as much air in as you possibly can and you strengthen your muscles of inspiration, which is your um, breathing in, your diaphragm. There's a um, breathing technique in Ayurveda called Pratiloma, where it's a maximum inspiratory breathing technique, and to make the diaphragm work a little bit harder, we pinch our nostrils just a little bit, and when we pinch our nostrils just a little bit, we create resistance, right? So if I want my diaphragm to work harder, I can breathe in maximally, but if I pinch my nostrils a little bit, and take a maximum breath. Now my diaphragm is going like, whoa, wait, wait, open up the passageways. Who's blocking the, who's creating the resistance? Me. I'm creating the resistance. And I take a belly chest, upper chest breath to do what? To maximally strengthen and contract my diaphragm. So Pratiloma, and I've written an article called Strengthen Your Lungs Now, an article called Breathe Away Your Heartburn, an article called Pratiloma, type in any of those and you will see these breathing techniques described and all the research behind them as well. But how you do it is you pinch your nostrils and take a maximal breath in. Now, you should know that, you know, I, I teach this to a lot of my patients and not everybody is really able to breathe deeply without getting noticeably dizzy or feeling a little uncomfortable. So what you would do with this breathing technique is you would try to take five of these maximal breathing technique, breathing practices, the pratilomas, as I just demonstrated. And if you get dizzy, fine, stop. That's good. That's where you were for today. And every day, go back and do a little bit more, a little bit more. And then your dizziness will actually start to move from five to 10 to 15 to 20 to 30, right? So your goal over time, no turning blue, no getting dizzy, no you know, anything like that. Your, breathe, your practice is to breathe gracefully and gently. And if you have a medical condition or a medication, you might want to ask your doctor about doing some deep breathing techniques. And that's important. 
but that once you get to breathe 30 maximal inhales with no dizziness, you can then introduce kumbak or breath retention, and then more rapidly slip into the intermittent hypoxia. I always recommend doing these exercises first as a warm up for your diaphragm, and then you can do your maximal inspiratory breathing through pratiloma. If you can do 30 of those with no dizziness, breathe out and then just hold your breath. Remember, the inhalation is through the nose maximal. The exhalation is gentle. Breathe out, not every last bit of air out, just a natural out. Hold your breath for five seconds, 10 seconds. So, as soon as you have the urge to breathe, pinch your nostrils again. Take another maximal breath in um, and go through your another 30 breaths of that. Do two to three sets a couple of times a day. And do those two, the, 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 the whole, this whole regime, which is more of a warm up for your diaphragm, followed by the pratiloma to get your diaphragm turned back on. Big believer in taking a month to really get that back on, and then you can maintain it with much less. It's really, really important. Again, there's a whole article, video with all the science behind this and how it all works, so at that lifespot.com. Another thing that you can do to learn how to lengthen your breath, and when you slow your breath down and lengthen it, you can, um, you can allow the um, carbon dioxide levels to build up because you're not breathing shallow and rapidly, blowing off CO2 and blowing off more oxygen than you can use, right? Or the excess oxygen, right? Um, and that is just going for a walk, a gentle walk, and count how many steps you take for each inhalation and each exhalation. So you take one, two, three steps for your inhalation and one, two, three steps for my exhalation. That's, the, that's what we're gonna call three on the in and three on the out. Three steps on your in-breath and three steps on your out-breath. You keep trying to lengthen that to five and five, to 10 and 10. When you get to 10 on the in and 10 on the out, I want you to begin to lengthen your exhalation. Continue the 10 on the inhalation, which is a long, slow, deep inhalation, and then do 15 to 20 on your exhalation. That's your goal. You know, you can do this even while you're running. You can do it while you're walking slow, briskly. It's a rough estimate. So, you know, just know that we're trying to lengthen the breath and you will notice that if you, if you practice this and try to lengthen your breath, you will actually see your breath lengthening. You'll be taking more steps for each breath. It's a beautiful, beautiful practice. Another technique that I'm a really big fan is to go for a walk after you eat your meals, taking big, long, slow nasal breaths, just natural breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. After the meal, it's really important because that gets that diaphragm working and massages your stomach. That actually has been shown to help support indigestion, better blood sugar. It takes the stress off your arterial endothelial lining after meals, which is pretty intense. It's part of one of the reasons we don't want to have a big meal and then go to bed is because there's arterial pressure uh, and the endothelium in your arteries that can be dangerous after a big meal. So you wanna create efficiency of digestion. It's called Shata Pavali, which means take at least 100 steps after every meal is an old, old Ayurvedic remedy. And then also learning how to breathe through your mouth, I'm sorry, through your nose at night while you sleep. Um, I use a, I use a, uh, a tape to train myself. I don't tape myself every night, but I do tape my, my mouth and I use this, it's called Next Care. It's a blue tape for sensitive skin. I get it right in the grocery store. It's for sensitive skin, so it's got a safe glue in it and all that. And what you do is you just put it like this before you go to bed. No cream on your face, that area, because it won't stick. Put it there. And if you wake up in the morning and it's stuck to the wall somewhere, didn't go well that night, you opened up your mouth. But when you stick it here and you get to the point where you can, you can actually get that tape, you know, and to be still there and sealed in the morning, then you can start doing it all the way across. And once that's sealed, you've trained yourself and you can stop doing it. And then you're, now you're training yourself. And why is that important? Because when you breathe through your nose during all these pranayama techniques, as well as breathing through your nose while you sleep, the paranasal sinuses produce a gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, is a gas that is a powerful antiviral gas. It's also a panacea gas, really important in many, many ways. Nitric oxide has been shown to increase mitochondrial energy, 
been shown to support arterial health. It's been shown to lower increased enzymes for detoxification like glutathione and superoxide dismutase. It's been shown to lower your basal metabolic index, in other words, lose a little bit of weight, increases cellular immunity, uh, cellular immunity rather. Uh, it's been shown as an anti-inflammatory. It's been shown to support an antiviral agent and also hormonal repair. Those are all the things that nitric oxide will do. Not to mention, you know, you're out talking to people all day long, your respiratory tract's exposed to all kinds of bacteria and viruses. Then you go to sleep, breathe through your nose, you wash your whole respiratory tract with this most powerful antiviral gas. It's one of our ways to keep us healthy and keep us alive because there were bugs trying to get us from the very beginning of time. So that's one of the ways nature did it. In traditional cultures in India, um, in Native American cultures and traditional cultures always train their babies to breathe through those. When I wrote my book, Body, Mind, and Sport, and I was doing research in India, I stumbled upon many studies about nose breathing uh, where parents would teach their kids how to nose breathe while they would sleep. They would tuck their chin, put them on their slide, and make sure they were breathing through their nose when they slept at night. So those are some really cool ones that to learn about. Um, some of my favorite breathing techniques um, uh, probably one of my uh, most favorite ones um, is a breathing technique called Kapalabhate. Kapalabhate is a breathing technique called, means the, the skull cleansing technique. And that's a breathing technique where you actually use your abdominal muscles to contract to force the air out. And it looks something like this. And that forces the air out and creates sort of like a sound wave up into the head and creates a skull cleansing. It literally means skull cleansing technique. And studies show that when you do that, it's been shown to activate the dead space in your respiratory tract. So you clean out all the, the parts of your lungs that you haven't been using. It's been shown to decrease parasympathetic, uh, increase parasympathetic, decrease sympathetic activity. It's been shown to balance your, your hypothalamus, which regulates you know, many of the body's metabolic functions, lowers blood sugar. Uh, it's been shown to reduce abdominal fat. It's been shown to increase liver lipases, which is the, the lipases or the enzymes that break down your fat. It's been shown to lower cholesterol, increase your ATP, which is your mitochondrial energy, and boost immunity. So that's one that I'm a big fan of, and you can practice. Go to my website, read about Kapalabhati, learn more about how to do it. And my other one, my favorite one I'm going to talk about now is called Brahmari. And Brahmari is a, is a bellows or bastrika breath where you... That one is a really powerful exercise and that's been shown to increase your nitric, uh, increase your production of nitric oxide. Um, I'm sorry, this is called, not Brahmari, it's called bastrika. I'm gonna talk about Brahmari in a second. Um, but bastrika also, because you're breathing through the perinasal sinuses, it increases your nitric oxide. But it also has been shown the bastrika to be that bellows breath. It gets everything uh, moving. I talk a lot about this as part of my one-minute meditation. I'm a big fan of doing bastrika, maximal breathing, uh, as a one-minute meditation. 30 seconds of bastrika, 30 seconds just sitting still. It could be in your car before you go into the office, whatever. It's been shown to increase gamma brainwave activity. Gamma brainwaves have been shown in mice to actually reverse plaque in their brain. It's been shown to, in Western medicine, it's known to expand consciousness. It increases cortical connectivity. It increases alertness. It increases, um, over time, it increases your perception. It's uh, actually the, va the uh, brainwave pattern for higher states of consciousness, right? So doing 30 seconds of bastrika, Thirty seconds of being still with your eyes closed is a powerful reset. You got to try that. It's one of my absolute favorites. And then there's Brahmari. Brahmari is the humming breathing technique where you hum. Mm. When you hum, that vibration activates the paranasal sinuses to produce 15 times more nitric oxide than you would if you just nasal breathe. So a really great technique. I love to do that technique before you go to bed. You sit up and breathe in through your nose, long, slow, gentle, exhale, hum. Mm. And create that resonant effect. If you wanna 
have a more of an effect. You can actually plug your ears, breathe in, normal, breathe in through your nose, plug your ears. And you'll hear a resonance in your head, a beautiful kind of resonance. And the technique is to feel that resonance in your head and see if you can create a resonance in your heart and then create a vibration or a resonance between the two. It's a beautiful technique for Brahmari, means Brahma, which means higher states of consciousness. We also know it increases nitric oxide by 15 times, but it's a powerful tool for, again, for increasing gamma brainwave activity, higher states of consciousness, as well as creating a vibration to actually move the brain lymphatic system. So much of these breathing techniques are, are really tools for increasing the brain lymphatic drainage, the three pounds of plaque and trash we talked about. I've written articles about nausea, which is a powerful tool for that, vigorous head massage, a powerful tool for that. So many tools, and also there's herbs for the brain lymphatic system, like, um, like Brahmi brain, like uh, Manjista, like our lymph vein, um, like our lymph cleanse. These are all herbs that are, and omega-3 fatty acids have been shown, turmeric has been shown to be powerful brain lymphatic movers to support brain health and brain function as well. Okay, well, that's a bit of an introduction to breathing techniques and breathing practices. I hope that you enjoyed that. I hope that helped you. Like I said, there's many articles and videos that you can go to um, to learn more and dive deep. I've written, gosh, at least 100 articles probably just on breathing practices alone. So dive in, learn more about Ayurveda, and, um, you know, like I said, Ayurveda is the Ayur, Ayur's life, Veda is truth. It's all about letting the truth of who you are out. And that's what these breathing techniques first and foremost are really about. But getting that diaphragm to function is so important for your digestion, for your lymphatic system, for your physiological function, and to stave off any type of accelerated, unnecessary aging factors. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Dugard. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.